Good evening or good morning, whichever it is for you. Thank you for joining us today for this online event. My name is Reto Malacrida. I am with the WTO Secretariat, where I head the Government Procurement and Competition Policy Group. I am pleased to be your moderator for the first part of today's event. As everyone will be aware, at today's event, we are launching a new book that has just been published. The book in question is entitled Competition Policy and Intellectual Property in Today's Global Economy. This book is the most recent result of a close and fruitful partnership between the WIPO Secretariat and the WTO Secretariat that dates back many years. The book looks at an important and timely topic, the intersection of competition policy and intellectual property protection. In our view, the book helps to substantially enhance understanding in an area which, until today, not enough researchers have explored. For us in the WTO Secretariat, the book is a major asset in that it helps to support our technical assistance activities on the WTO's TRIPS agreement. But we will let you judge the importance of the book for yourself, as we will hear today from various speakers, including many of the authors who have contributed to the book. As the speakers will be numerous, we request that every speaker keep within his or her allocated time slot. We thank you in, in advance for your cooperation. Should any of you experience any technical or connection issues, please let our team know immediately. And at this stage, I want to thank the entire team for their great preparation work and their support. With this introduction, let me now say that we are most fortunate to have with us today two high profile speakers to help us launch the book. In keeping with the fact that this book is the result of the WTO and WIPO working closely together, we are delighted to have senior officials from each secretariat deliver opening remarks. Our first speaker will be Mrs. Annabel Gonzalez, who is a Deputy Director General with the WTO Secretariat. Her remarks will be complemented by Mr. Edward Kwakwa, who is Assistant Director General with WIPO. So without further ado, let me now invite DDG Gonzalez to give her opening remarks. DDG, you have the floor. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Reto, and uh, hello okay. to uh, everyone. Uh, it is a true pleasure for me uh, to join my colleague, Edward Kwakwa, in uh, marking the launch of this uh, groundbreaking volume, Competition Policy and Intellectual Property in Today's Global Economy a joint publication by WIPO and the WTO. I know that the conception and development and final production of this publication has entailed an enormous amount of work by a diverse group of colleagues within and beyond our two organizations. And I would like to recognize the leadership of uh, Robert Anderson, Nuno Pires de Carvalho, and Anthony Tubman in editing this, uh, this publication, and of course, uh, the work of all the uh, contributing authors. By way of uh, acknowledging that dedicated hard work and celebrating the collegial and collaborative spirit behind it, I would like to highlight a few key aspects of this project following the general theme of uh, working outside silos, itself very much an emphasis in the work of the WTO today. The book we are launching uh, epitomizes this spirit, I think, in many ways. So first, as the authors have underscored, it was uh, customary to think, uh, it was once customary, and maybe in some places it still is, uh, to think of the intellectual property community on the one hand, and the antitrust or competition policy community on the other. They supposedly represented two distinct policy communities, guided by divergent views of the world at, uh, and sets of uh, values uh, hunkered down in their separate silos and evenly squarely at odds in critical policy debates. That simplistic caricature, uh, if it ever was true, 
is plainly refuted by the rich insights provided by the 26 chapters of this volume. They demonstrate that an integrated and dynamic grasp of the interplay between IP and competition policy is essential today if we are to trace the disruptive impact and the economic promise of new technologies, and if we are to understand knowledge, innovation, and human capital as critical ingredients for economic and social welfare. Second, competition policy and its interaction with the IT system are no longer seen uh, as largely the preoccupation of a handful of developed country economies. To the contrary, the, this is now a mainstream consideration of development policy in many economies. A key chapter analyzes the lively development of competition in IP policy guidelines in an increasing range of developing country economies. We know from our active technical cooperation in this field that the overwhelming majority of WTO members have active competition agencies with a strong interest in charting current trends internationally and in learning from one another's practical experience. The volume also analyzes the important contribution made by WIPO in addressing competition policy as an element of its development agenda, charting a pathway out of the silos and reframing the conversation about IP and competition. For the WTO, addressing these uh, uh, themes was an important component of the early work of the Working Group on Trade and Competition Policy, and it remains a key element of the framework established by the TRIPS Agreement, which maps out several linkages between the IP system and the application of competition norms. Third, this volume highlights the essential relationship between the application of competition policy principles at the domestic level and the principles of non-discrimination in international trade. We know, again, from our technical assistance and uh, our dialogue with members, that understanding the interplay between domestic competition policy and international trade policy is an immediate practical interest for many countries. Certainly, given the osmosis and synergy between them and the interconnectedness of the national systems in the global economy, these two policy domains can no longer be understood, let alone regulated in distinct silos. If we consider the vital role of international knowledge flows for social and economic development, then understanding the interplay between IP, competition policy, and trade policy becomes all the more critical. Fourth, and I wonder if maybe this is one of the most uh, sturdily defended silos, we need to breach between the perspectives of economists and lawyers. These two communities have traditionally framed and analyzed the IP system in divergent ways, but both perspectives and both toolkits are absolutely essential as is an integrated approach. One of the strengths of this volume is indeed that it brings together a, a stellar range of experts, uh, diverse both geographically and in their areas of expertise and experience. Their combined contributions add concretely to our growing understanding about the dynamic nature of competition, in particular, innovation as itself a form of socially valuable form of competition, and the critical balance between valuable incentives and the avoidance of undue burdens on society. At the WTO, we are very conscious of this balance, as it is written into the TRIPS agreement itself, which states that the IP system, and I open quotes, should contribute to the promotion of technical innovation and to the transfer and dissemination of technology, to the mutual advantage of producers and users of technological knowledge, and in a manner conducive to social and economic welfare and to a balance of rights and obligations. This vital, complex, and ever dynamic interplay between private rights and the public interest needs constant and careful calibration with input from legal and economic experts alike. We hope that this volume serves as a platform for a renewed and reinvigorated international conversation, drawing together officials, experts, and scholars that is diverse in expertise and inclusive in geographical range. And that brings me to a final pair of silos, those of technical assistance and policy analysis. The technical assistance and policy support we provide for our member governments can't retain its relevance and practical impact unless it is informed by inclusive and contemporary analysis and research. 
We can't serve our members effectively by relying on past intellectual capital and without the benefits of fresh insights, especially given the fair wider geographical range of policy developments in this area. For the WTO Secretary, therefore, this volume epitomizes the kind of infusion of contemporary thinking that will help ensure our support for members remains in touch with current trends and developments. We certainly don't see the publication of this book as an end in itself, and we are hopeful that it will help open up new avenues of discussion and development that will assist policymakers around the world in charting the way ahead. The COVID-19 pandemic has shown us very starkly that innovation and access to the fruits of innovation are absolutely essential to the welfare of humanity across the globe. While this volume was completed uh, substantially um, just prior to the onset of the pandemic, I hope that the insights it offers will play a valuable role in our collective, collective efforts to build back better, to ensure that's the, that the new normal is able to benefit communities worldwide. I, I conclude by expressing uh, my warm thanks uh, to all of the contributors who have provided such a rich array of scholarship and analysis, and to the editorial team who have worked so hard to bring this material together. I thank you for joining us for this lunch, and I hope you find this publication enriching and stimulating. Thank you very much. Thank you very much indeed, DDG, for your kind words and your <clears throat> comprehensive comments. May I now immediately invite the ADG from the White Pole, uh, Mr. Kwakwa, to deliver his opening remarks. Thank you very much, Redo. Dear Annabelle, dear Tony, dear Robert, dear Giovanni, in fact, dear everybody, it's great to see so many friendly faces, even if it's virtual. Let me simply start by thanking the World Trade Organization, including, of course, Deputy Director General Annabel Gonzalez, for the opportunity to jointly launch this WTO WIPO publication, which, as you know, is entitled Competition Policy and Intellectual Property in Today's Global Economy. Now, as Ms. Gonzalez has mentioned, the work behind this publication has been long and complex, also because the issues that are at the core of this book are continuously evolving with new legislation, <clears throat> with new case law, with new technologies, and in fact, with new intellectual property challenges that arise both in developing countries and in developed countries. So considering these complexities, I can only commend the editors and those who contributed to this research for their enormous commitment. This publication, in our minds, also symbolizes the excellent cooperation between our two institutions, WTO and WIPO. And this is a cooperation that has a long history and that for at least the past 10 years has also focused on the interplay between intellectual property and competition policy. Now, speaking about the book being launched, I believe there are three main trends that characterize the IP competition policy interface. And all these trends are very well discussed in the book. So first, is the increasing internationalization of both intellectual property and competition law and policy. We all know jurisdictions from all corners of the world have been working to approximate their national laws and policies to the good practices put in place in various countries. In this respect, the book of international, the work of international organizations such as WTO, such as WIPO, in fact, such as UNCTAD, the UN Conference on Trade and Development, the Organization for Economic Cooperation and Development, as well as the International Competition Network, 
and the International Consumer Protection Enforcement Network has provided the ideal platform to discuss the different approaches to intellectual property and competition policy and to look for the right balance in order to encourage innovation and creativity. For decades now, we all know the business community has been very active in entering international markets, posing new challenges to both the intellectual property and the competition policy communities. And one of WIPO's main objectives in this area is specifically to bring those two communities closer together to foster the mutual understanding of how intellectual property rights may impact the competitive dynamics of innovation markets and to specify how competition policy and law enforcement may affect the strategic intellectual property choices made by the business community. So as mentioned in the book's introduction, there is, and here I am quoting, a need for a unified analysis of competition and intellectual property law and policy, end quote. Since, again, quote, the two fields have become so interdependent and intertwined that neither can be adequately studied understood or applied in the absence of the other, end quote. I did mention three trends. The second trend, which is also well analyzed in the publication, relates to how the relevance of the IP competition policy interplay is no longer a concern just for a few agencies in developed countries but has in fact become extremely relevant in emerging and other fast growing economies worldwide. When we look at the well-documented number of agencies that have drafted competition law guidelines in the field of intellectual property, it appears clear, it's beyond doubt that intellectual property has become one of the key assets for a company's, indeed, for a country's competitiveness. Of course, when we mention intellectual property, we do not just refer to patents, but we are referring to the whole intellectual property ecosystem, including trademarks, designs, copyright, geographical indications, and all these IP rights have their own key relevance in the strategic development of an industry. And each intellectual property right should thus be understood in its own specific nature. WIPO for its part has been directly involved in the international discussion on IP and competition policy in developing as well as in emerging economies and WIPO will continue to do so in the future. Therefore, this WTO WIPO book represents a very important step in that direction and more analysis inevitably will be needed as we enter into a new dimension of the IP and competition policy interplay with network industries, with the health sector, with new green technologies all being at the center of the international debate. Now, let me say the growing need for more substantial programs of technical assistance and capacity building in the IP and competition interplay is the third element that characterizes this field. Technical assistance in the last, in the two areas specifically, has rarely been part of the same agenda. In fact, in WIPO, we started as far back as 2007 to deal with the IP and competition policy interface as one of our so-called development agenda projects. 
these activities have now been fully streamlined in the work of the organization. And we are seeking the cooperation, not just of WTO, but also of other international organizations and institutions. We want to expand this area of work and to reach out to member states and agencies that may wish to strengthen or develop the necessary tools in order to better understand the intricacies of intellectual property in its interaction with competition policy. This, of course, includes a discussion also on unfair competition matters, deceptive and misleading commercial practices that are possibly complementary to the strictly antitrust concerns. The relationship between IP competition policy and unfair competition is also very well discussed in the book putting consumer interests at the center of our attention and future work. To conclude, Mr. Moderator, I would like to again thank our WTO colleagues for this very fruitful collaboration. Our two organizations work together in many other areas of common interest. And as WIPO Assistant Director General, who is responsible not only for the IP and competition policy area, but also for WIPO's partnerships in general. And I should add this, given my personal continuing attachment to WTO, for the simple reason I worked there as a staff member some two and a half decades ago, I am still committed to strengthening our relationship, our cooperation in the years to come. So again, following what Deputy Director General Gonzalez said, let me also thank our esteemed, accomplished editors and the contributors of the various chapters. And let me simply say from the WIPO side, I'd like to recognize and thank my colleagues, Giovanni Napolitano, who is the director of our IP and competition policy division, Ms. Sonia Krukshank, who is a senior program officer in the division, and not least, Mr. Miles Rogerson, who is interning with us in the division. For those of you who don't yet already have your books, please go get them as soon as you can. Thank you very much, Reto. Back to you. Thank you so much, uh, ADG Kwakwa, for your very kind and warm words and for your very thoughtful comments as well. So on behalf of everyone involved and in attendance today, I wish to warmly thank DDG Gonzalez and ADG Kwakwa for honoring us with their presence today and generously, generously giving us some of their time. We thank you both for your support. Now, before moving to the next segment of the program, and while we still have the benefit of our senior officials' presence for just a few more moments, may we suggest that we briefly take a picture with all the contributors present today. And if you are willing to uh, accommodate us, could I therefore invite that all panelists who will participate today could briefly uh, switch on their cameras if they haven't already done so, so that my colleagues could take a picture. I am informed that one of our team members will then let us know when the picture has been taken and when we can move on to the next segment of our program. So at this point, could you kindly switch on your cameras if not done already and wait for guidance from one of our team members. Thank you very much. I haven't seen so many people in ties since before the pandemic. I've been asked to let everyone know to kindly smile. I thought I thought that was understood, but <laughs> <laughs> Good. 
Colleagues, I don't think we can hold our smiles for very much longer. <laughs> Excellent. Thank you. I think uh, it's all done. It's all in the box. So as promised, we will gladly share the picture with you. And once again, thank you so much to our senior officials. And we do, of course, understand that you have other business to attend to. So feel absolutely free to um, move on to other things at this stage. But once again, thank you so much. So with that said, may I then <clears throat> move everyone along to precisely our, our next segment. And for this next part, we would like you all uh, to meet the three editors of the book and give them an opportunity to talk about some of the ideas behind and some of the content of the book. So let me take turns and introduce them to you one by one and, and have them immediately offer their remarks so you can um, you know, follow as they speak. So our first editor who will speak is Mr. Robert Anderson. Robert is currently an honorary professor in the School of Law at the University of Nottingham in the United Kingdom. Until March 2019, he was a senior WTO official and served as my immediate predecessor in the Government Procurement and Competition Policy Group. Rob Anderson, thank you so much for being with us today. Congratulations on the book and you have the floor. So thanks very much, Reto. Um, and uh, is everyone hearing me, Reto? Yes? Sorry, yes, I was nodding, yes, indeed. Okay, thanks very much, Reto. And warm thanks also to Deputy Director General Annabel Gonzalez, whom it's a pleasure to see in her new role as, if I may still say so, our DDG. And also to Edward Kwakwa for the, of the World Intellectual Property Organization for his very thoughtful remarks. And it's great to see him in his new role. I remember meeting you, Edward, um, those two and a half decades ago. So, uh, dear friends, as you're all aware, this book has been a labor of love uh, for Tony Taubman and me, for our friend, colleague, and co-editor Nuno Carvalho, uh, for our superb contributing authors, a good number of whom are present, for our essential friend and colleague at WIPO, Giovanni Napolitano, who helped us through the process, and for many current and former colleagues in the WTO Secretariat over an extended period. So truly, it is gratifying that the volume is now out in print. As DDG Gonzalez and others have said, the issues explored in the volume are central to ongoing and emerging debates on innovation and access to technology, on trade and knowledge and knowledge embodying products, and on the role of markets in today's global economy. They are linked, the issues are linked also to current discussions on multiple hot topics, including public health, competition policy and network industries, accessing the technologies needed to adapt and respond to global climate change, and more generally, ensuring an equitable and human-centered framework for global prosperity and peace in the 21st century. In important respects though, the issues canvassed in the current volume are not altogether new. The interface of competition policy and intellectual property was one of the first issues to which I was exposed when I joined the Canadian Competition Bureau as a young staffer in 1982. In those early days, we spoke with a degree of fervor of the need to counteract and where possible, dilute the impact of patents and other forms of intellectual property, or as we used to call them, statutory monopolies. Thankfully, since then, the world has come rather a long way in its understanding of the interaction between these two policy areas. We know now, for example, that intellectual property has elements in common and characteristics in common with other forms of property rights. And that notwithstanding the old perceptions, 
intellectual property or IP most often serves pro-competitive functions. For example, in promoting innovation, in facilitating product differentiation and enabling in enabling trade in knowledge and knowledge intensive goods. This is not to deny that intellectual property rights are sometimes cast in overly broad terms or that abuses may occur and may need to be counteracted by the appropriate application of competition laws as we outline at length in this volume. This evolution of thinking in which prominent scholars, the IP community, and the competition agencies themselves, critically, um, all played very significant roles, is a fascinating story and one that gets attention uh, throughout the volume. It's the focus of chapter two of the book, which I had the privilege of co-authoring with Bill Kovacic, who I believe will speak in a few minutes. I thank Bill and all the colleagues with whom I discussed these issues in my old days in the Competition Bureau, including the economist Nancy Gallini, with whom I edited an early volume on related topics. Now, initially, like most others, I conceived of these issues primarily as conundrums to be worked out at the national level. When I came to the WTO in 1997, however, I gradually came to realize over time that the issues and developments I had worked on in Canada and at least also observed unfolding in the US and the U European Union had very important application and repercussions at the global level. Indeed, I submit now that in the interdependent and knowledge-based economy of our era, it is folly for countries to try to resolve these issues in isolation from each other. In a world where something like 134 WTO member jurisdictions have national competition laws, at a minimum, we need to speak with and learn from each other regarding these matters. This realization came to me uh, initially very much through conversations, conversations with persons such as Tony Taubman, our co-editor Nuno, who was already present when I joined the WTO in 1997, uh, with my friend, mentor, and former director in the Secretariat, Adrian Auten, and with other cherished colleagues, including Hanu Vagar, um, Jayashri Watel, uh, and a vital collaborator for me in multiple related endeavors, Anna Caroline Mueller. An essential point of departure for our volume to be addressed later by my colleague Anna is that in key respects, the complementary relationship of competition policy and intellectual property is already recognized and embodied in relevant provisions of the WTO agreement on trade-related aspects of intellectual property rights. These include, but are by no means limited to, the provisions on anti-competitive licensing practices and those on compulsory licensing. Yet, and as Tony, Anna, and I point out in chapter three of the present volume, the relevant provisions of the TRIPS agreement also leave many important questions unanswered. These questions include at a minimum, what are the full set of practices that may be considered as abuses of intellectual property under national competition legislation? What are the standards under which such practices are to be judged? And what are the appropriate remedies? Our book is in part an attempt to provide answers to those questions or at least, and probably more modestly, to assemble relevant insights as a basis for reflection on these questions. And in seeking the answers to these questions, we have looked to two principal sources. 
First, the extensive pre-existing legal and economic literature, including contributions authored by many friends, collaborators, and contributors to the present volume. And second, the practical experience of jurisdictions in addressing related problems and applying relevant measures around the globe. And the feature of the book of which I am most proud is the breadth of empirical and policy experience that it chronicles, including experiences not only of the US and Canada um, and of the European Union and its member states, but also of the BRICS economies of Japan and Korea and various other emerging and developing jurisdictions all around the world. This cross-jurisdictional and comparative focus pervades the book. It is the particular focus of the extended comparative chapter, which will be introduced later by my colleague, Nadia Sporysheva, who had a vital and central role in preparing that analysis and in supporting the overall production of the book. The proliferation of interest in the issues across jurisdictions carries significant implications. Um, what I'm saying is that the, the proliferation of interest in these issues now far beyond the original countries that thought about these things, the United States, the European Union, its member states, Canada, now all the way around the world, this carries significant implications. And, you know, in that context, in the book, we have raised for further reflection without seeking to categorically resolve um, urgent questions regarding a need for further cross-jurisdictional reflections. And potentially, I submit on a personal basis, even a modest degree of cross-jurisdictional policy coordination and strengthened international cooperation in this area to be underpinned by a broad uh, and inclusive learning process across jurisdictions. So these are the essential points of context, background, and motivation regarding the book that I wanted to mention in introducing the volume. Related points will be elaborated now by uh, you, Tony, by my collaborators, Bill Kovacic, Anna, Anna Caroline Mueller, Nadia, and Antonella Salguero, who was another collaborator whose work was essential to producing this work, this volume. By the superb and irreplaceable Eleanor Fox, whom I'm proud to have known now for a long time since my days in the Canadian Bureau, and by other excellent contributing authors who are present today. So I conclude by again thanking you, Tony, and Reto, and Nuno, our dedicated and patient contributing authors, and our terrific team of colleagues, collaborators, and supporters in the WTO Secretariat. Thank you. Thank you very much indeed, Rob Anderson, for giving us such a detailed insight into, as you called it, the context, the background, and the motivation behind this important new book. With a view to time, let us move straight on to the next editor. And as has been mentioned, in principle, that was a slot to have been occupied by Mr. Nuno Carvalho. Unfortunately, due to a last minute development, we regret to say he's not able to join us today. Fortunately, however, his WIPO colleague and one of the authors who has contributed to the book, Mr. Giovanni Napolitano, has kindly agreed to step into the breach. Giovanni is director, as we have already heard from ADG Quacqua of the Intellectual Property and Competition Policy Department at WIPO. Previously, he was also deputy director and director of the Transition and Developed Countries Department also with WIPO, and before that worked for the Italian Competition Authority. Thank you so much, Giovanni, for your flexibility. We are very pleased to have you with us. Giovanni, you have the floor, please. Um, thank you very much, uh, Redo. As, as you mentioned, I am 
uh, replacing Nuno. Of course, nobody could really uh, replace somebody like uh, Nuno Carvalho, but I will try to do my best uh, in uh, uh, giving my uh, short contribution to this uh, uh, important event. Uh, and uh, thank you very much, uh, uh, Director General Gonzalez and uh, ADG uh, Edward Papa for being with us today, and uh, Rob for your um, kind words uh, before. Uh, this has been indeed um, a work of love. Um, if I recollect uh, correctly, this has started, I think, in 2012 or 2013, so it's been a, a long uh, process, and uh, as it has already been mentioned, you know, this was done while the uh, our reference references were uh, moving very fast. Uh, the technologies were changing. The case law was continuously evolving. Uh, countries were introducing guidelines on the implementation of competition law uh, uh, in intellectual property rights. So we really had to shoot at a moving target. Uh, but uh, I think with the excellent uh, uh, contributions of so many uh, scholars uh, in the competition policy field, I think we have achieved a great result. And thanks again for uh, all those who contributed to, um, uh, to this result. Um, let me start by saying that uh, uh, competition policy sort of entered into the discussion in uh, WFTO uh, around 2007. Uh, when we developed the, when we approved the development uh, agenda, and some of the recommendations included in the development agenda uh, were uh, strictly related to uh, uh, competition policy. Um, it started as a as a project, and uh, as um, Edward Clarkwell was mentioning, it stream became a part of the um, overall uh, WIPO program in. Um, in 2011, and um, and the work continued uh, on uh, uh, several uh, lines. One of which was exactly to um, have within WIPO uh, an opportunity for exchange uh, on national and regional experiences, and information on the links between intellectual property rights and competition uh, policies. Now, this book, in fact, is part of this uh, exercise of uh, uh, sharing the experiences and providing uh, a better understanding of the interplay between intellectual property um, and competition. Um, now, in, in the years um, after 2007 and after 2011, when the Competition uh, Policy Division was created, um, our experience has been that um, although the uh, theoretical background was changing uh, quite quickly, the competition agencies had to deal more and more with IP-related uh, cases. Um, and of course, the first ones that come to mind are those in the pharmaceutical sector. Um, but in fact, there are many other areas of um, uh, in interface between the two areas. And this is not just in uh, developed countries, um, but also in developing uh, uh, countries and in young uh, agencies. Because we have to realize that there are many instances where uh, not just patents, but uh, trademarks, uh, designs, and some aspects of unfair competition are uh, involved. Um, one of the striking uh, points that I think we experienced in our capacity building activities was sometimes the disconnect between the uh, competition policy and enforcement uh, community and the uh, intellectual property community. Um, some of the countries uh, uh, had had no interaction whatsoever uh, with the other agency. Uh, and therefore, uh, some of the um, IP-related competition cases were dealt with without any um, cooperation uh, with the, uh, or interaction with the IP agency. And we realized that this was one of the elements that in fact made very productive or very sensible the uh, uh, implementation of uh, competition law in those countries where that collaboration was in place. 
Uh, so one of our effort was and is uh, even today to bring together uh, those um, communities uh, to let them talk to each other and understand each other's perspective, uh, because very often uh, some of the issues that have um, uh, created uh, tensions between the two areas uh, come from the fact of, of, let's say, the lack of communication, a lack of collaboration between uh, the agencies. And this is very much uh, at the core uh, of, our, um, of our work. Um, now, the, uh, uh, I think the collaboration with uh, uh, WTO in this respect uh, has been very important, uh, as it has been with uh, uh, UNCTAD and the OECD. Uh, in fact, we, um, we had and we have uh, an interest group between uh, uh, us, WTO, UNCTAD, and OECD, uh, which is meant exactly to explore the interaction and the interplay between intellectual property and competition policy uh, to come up with uh, joint activities and uh, initiatives uh, in the spirit exactly of going beyond uh, the uh, supposed um, uh, friction between uh, intellectual property and competition law. Um, when I uh, left the, uh, the Italian Competition Authority to, uh, to, join the, to join WFU in the Competition Policy Division, uh, the, uh, the president of the Italian Competition Authority, uh, I remember, told me, Giovanni, I think you, you're going to work in a very uh, important area, uh, because remember that uh, without intellectual property, there would probably be much less markets and there would be much less market competition than, uh, than there is in fact with intellectual property. And we have to remember that it is exactly through intellectual property rights that companies are able, able to establish themselves uh, and to open up new markets with new products and services, which uh, in turn creates the incentive for their competitors with, to come up with something uh, better, something faster, something uh, cheaper. So I, I always keep those words in mind. And uh, I think that this book is the uh, uh, witness in a way of, um, of the importance uh, of the two areas, of the importance of intellectual property uh, for competition. And um, uh, we will do uh, all that we can to strengthen the, the institutional collaboration and to continue our joint work uh, in the foreseeable uh, future. Thank you very much. Thank you very much indeed, uh, Giovanni Napolitano. I, I believe you have concluded your remarks. Is that correct? I ask because uh, to our great regret, I think for some of us, the connection was, was less than ideal for parts of your comments, but I do believe we have been able to, to follow the, the main thoughts that you are developing. And thank you so much for doing that and for giving us some very interesting insights into the historical evolution of the interface between uh, competition and intellectual property and for emphasizing a, an aspect that is dear to, to you as much as it is to us, which is that we are very much intending to promote dialogue between different professional communities, the trade policy experts, the IP experts and community, as well as the competition policy experts. So uh, that was a, a very helpful um, you know, spotlight to, to throw. With that, we now come to our last, but certainly not least, editor um, in the person of Mr. Anthony Taupman, who I know has worked tirelessly and at impossible hours of day and night to ensure that this book project would, would be brought to fruition. So Anthony Taupman is the director of the WTO's Intellectual Property, Government Procurement and Competition Division, with responsibility, as the name indicates, for the Secretariat's work in all these three areas. Previously, he was director of the Global Intellectual Property Issues Division of WIPO and held various positions with the Australian government. Anthony Taupman, you have the floor, please. 
Many thanks indeed, Reto. And uh, let me pass on my thanks too, also to uh, our, our senior colleagues, uh, Annabel Gonzalez and Edward Kwakwa, and uh, to, uh, to our, our colleagues more broadly, and uh, especially our co-authors, and the team, the team uh, that is doing wonders, uh, keeping us all together um, on, on the screen here. Uh, I also have to thank my, my co-editors very, very warmly, uh, and uh, regret the absence of, of Nuno, who's very much here in, in, in spirit and, and uh, whose thinking has infused this book and produced some uh, remarkable chapters too. Uh, and I, and uh, I gladly thank uh, my co-editor, Rob Anderson, uh, firstly for thanking in more detail all the people I need to thank, uh, so I won't repeat that, but also for reminding me that a lot of what I thought was my own original thinking was actually what I learnt from many conversations with him. So uh, humbling but uh, valuable nonetheless, so thank, thank you, thank you Rob. And this is part of a broader point that this, thank you, this, this book looks like a rather, you know, inert uh, set of um, written pieces. It actually is infused and enlivened by many, many conversations uh, uh, among, among the authors uh, and, and other colleagues. And uh, that, that idea of conversation, as Giovanni has mentioned, is, is very much a theme uh, of, of what I'm gonna address is what this book is here for. Why do, why do we have a, a book uh, in front of us anyway? So we are dealing with uh, two very uh, complex, very dynamic and seemingly very constantly contested field of, of public policy, that of IP and competition, and indeed the contested uh, territory, it seems, between them. They, they do share a number of common characteristics, though. Um, one of them is that they are indeed uh, constantly moving targets, and it has been incredibly difficult to capture in a book of this character uh, the right kind of inclusive uh, and, I hope, somewhat deep and thoughtful analysis while at the same time making it topical and, and, uh, and uh, useful for today's policymakers. Uh, we'll leave it to, to, to the, the readers, I hope, to, to uh, judge whether we've succeeded. What brings, them, what brings these two areas together is, uh, as, as been mentioned, the, the incredible diversity now of domestic practice. Uh, the fact that, as Rob mentioned, uh, over 130 countries now have competition authorities wrestling with these areas. This is, uh, and, and for that matter, intellectual property policy making at, at the same time. Uh, and this is a ever more diverse range of countries, diverse geographically, uh, economically, of course, but also in their legal traditions and in the ways of framing uh, policy uh, in this area. And the guidance that you get from international uh, 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 rules and, and, and norms is, is, is still quite broad brush in, in character and, and potentially possibly a very good thing. As, as Rob has mentioned in our chapter on, on TRIPS, for example, uh, we note that uh, the TRIPS agreement marks out uh, space for, for policy making in this area, but it's certainly not prescriptive in, in terms of um, the, the detail approach. And that, that's something that we need to, to, to learn from and, uh, and uh, infuse into a wider discussion. Equally, uh, both areas are impacted by, by technology change and, and the disruptive uh, impact of the digital economy. Uh, both are caught up in the, uh, in my view, uh, urgently needed emphasis on the knowledge component of social and e economic development. And it's one of the, the dreadful lessons of, of the uh, COVID pandemic, uh, which has brought such misery across the globe that it's not a, it's not a luxury to think about um, innovation and above all equitable access to the fruits of innovation, uh, it, it is an absolute necessity. And uh, the convergence of intellectual property and competent policies is certainly part of getting, getting that, that equation right. What I think we, what, what infused the, the push this project forward was the, the idea that we might be able to show that these two areas, sort of in a caricature set at, at odds with one another, are combined by, by common goals, uh, both in principle and by a practical need uh, to ensure a coherent approach is taken to deliver in practice on, on, on those, those objectives. Through the dialogue that uh, Giovanni has mentioned, uh, but more than that, I, I think through a, a, a focus on shared goals, shared objectives, and a, a syner synergistic approach, uh, 
DDG uh, Gonzalez has, has quoted from the, the TRIPS agreement, a reminder that uh, the TRIPS agreement says, well, why do we have an IP system? It is uh, to promote innovation, but also to promote access to the fruits of innovation. And with the idea that this should conduce to social and economic welfare and a balance of rights and obligations. And there you have framed exactly the counterpoint that we're looking for in this volume. And indeed, uh, the idea that these are two fields at odds with each other, uh, we've tried to confront in different ways. Uh, one of my chapters uh, charts the early roots of uh, intellectual property law and policy, going back some centuries, looking at uh, the three areas, main areas, patents, trademarks, copyright, and tries to demonstrate uh, historically that uh, they, they really do have, have common roots. Uh, one very obvious example is the 1623 law, uh, the, the so-called statute of monopolies, that in the common law tradition often appears as, as an early patent law in the textbooks. But what does it say? It says all monopolies, all commissions, grants, licenses, letters, patent, are altogether contrary to the laws of this realm, and so shall be utterly void and of none effect. This is Elizabethan English and in no wise shall be put to use or execution. It's a law that abolishes patents, apparently. Uh, that's, its, that's its function. Uh, but what we have as today recognized as patents of invention are spelled out as a limited exception to this, what is this piece of, of competition policy legislation above, above all else. Right. Uh, and so more broadly, I mean, that's just one, one very easy um, uh, example to pick, but uh, we have tried to show that, uh, that there are uh, common roots to these areas of, of law. It's not as though they're being um, welded together at the, as a, at the last minute. Uh, there are common roots that, that do need to be explored and, and help us understand the shared values. Uh, also, there's a recognition that, uh, there's, that, that uh, well, business can't be relied to operate uh, uh, completely free of regulation and uh, we would therefore hope that all business activity is overall to society's benefit. There's a recognition that some degree of, of intervention by, by legal form uh, in a balanced way uh, is part of ensuring that uh, commercial activity contributes to, to public welfare outcomes. And uh, uh, from that point of view, uh, uh, I've also explored the relationship between what we call in um, IP territory, unfair competition, and the broader uh, field of, of competition policy as such. Uh, uh, as, again, as a way of trying to show at least that policymakers in the two areas uh, uh, are, are moving in, in the same direction, even in that kind of rather um, uncertain field. Uh, what, I've, what I've tried to do there is, is to show that uh, if we pull back the, the details and look at the common roots and, and the, the essential objectives, we see more commonality than than initially meets the eye, and certainly that that uh, some of us experts uh, toiling away in the silos that Annabelle has mentioned, uh, that we tend to overlook. A, a final uh, point of convergence is that both fields and overlapping also with the field of international trade policy are trying to make sense of the impact of digital disruption. And again, we explore that uh, in, in the volume, looking at the idea that, you know, the very idea of markets is being redefined uh, by these, these digital platforms that we're working with today. Uh, information is, is traded uh, internationally uh, 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 in, in ways that were un, un, not imagined even at the time of the uh, negotiations that led to the, the, the TRIPS agreement that we have today. So uh, what we've tried to do is, is explore how the, these changing uh, uh, technological and uh, uh, economic impacts have uh, forced uh, a reconsideration of uh, the, these, these basic areas of law and policy, which simply cannot be uh, inert. Finally, I mean, and, and uh, people have touched on this uh, already, in both cases, we don't see these, these policy areas as ends in themselves. We, we often say intellectual property does not exist as an end in itself. It is there to serve uh, social and economic goals. Likewise, Competition policy, not an end in itself. Uh, competition per se is, is not a social good. It, it 
in a balanced and, and uh, an appropriate way, it serves uh, uh, social and economic welfare. Likewise, publication of this very book was not an end in itself. Uh, handsome though it is, uh, I hope you get a copy. It is a, an attractive volume, but that's not the purpose. The purpose was not to produce a book. The purpose was to create a, a, a fresh platform, an inclusive, uh, thoughtful, uh, geographically diverse uh, platform that, that draws together uh, current insights, current experience to help uh, contribute to a fresh, uh, and I think, I think we all think, uh, an urgently needed international conversation, that word again, deliberately, uh, uh, one that uh, benefits from the huge amount of practical experience that those 134 different jurisdictions uh, are undertaking and that in turn feeds into a richer understanding of, of how to get these, these balances right. We talk about this balance in the abstract, but it is a practical art uh, and, and a challenge for policymakers around the world. So we, we have tried to, to uh, in this book, to deliver on that in, in a number of ways. Uh, above all, a respectful dialogue between the two areas, uh, IP and competition. Uh, it's a two-way conversation. Secondly, and it can't be emphasized too much, we've tried to be as, as widely inclusive and take a fully comparative approach so that it's not a matter of deciding whether you prefer the approach taken in Brussels or the approach taken in, in Washington. Uh, you can learn from uh, the experience in, in a wide range of, of jurisdictions. Uh, so it's a more inclusive approach. Uh, we've tried to make the work interdisciplinary, uh, not just in terms of uh, are you an IP uh, or competition policy expert, or are you a lawyer or an economist, but also interplay between the, the scholarly community, uh, the, the policy community, and, and uh, the world of, of, of practitioners. So that, that's, the, that's the, um, the approach we've been taken. We, we, we very much hope that this is still, even in this dynamic field, still very directly relevant to uh, both contemporary policy makers and to scholars. Uh, and we hope very much that this, this platform serves indeed as a springboard for this much needed um, uh, international conversation. It's certainly one that uh, in our work in the WTO, we're, we're committed to uh, with our partners in WIPO, but also with the other partners that Giovanni helpfully, me helpfully mentioned, uh, our friends and colleagues in, in uh, uh, NUNCTAD, uh, in, in the OECD and, and, and other areas where we've had really excellent um, cooperation and, and, and conversations, but well beyond that, that framework. So thank you very much uh, again uh, for, for joining us and thank you again to, to the remarkable team uh, that have put this book together. Thank you very much, uh, Tony Talkman, for sketching out in at least broad outline some of the key policy questions that are addressed in the in the book, and certainly, I think, uh, motivates everyone to dig uh, a lot deeper. Having now heard from the editors as well as Giovanni Napolitano, we have completed part one of our program today, and, and there is much more to come, so don't go away. And we can indeed now move to part one, but it's time to switch horses, as it were. And um, I would therefore, for part uh, two of the program, like to pass the moderator's role to Anthony Topman as one of the architects of and leading minds behind the book. And so he will uh, lead everyone through the presentations of, of some of the individual chapters, which will be presented by the authors. So with that, I hand over to you, Tony, as the new moderator. Thank you. Thank, thank you, Reto, and thank you for, for uh, 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 taking us through this, this important first session. Uh, with all due respect to all concerned, I, I, I urge people to stay online because the best is indeed yet to come. And indeed, our, our, our very next uh, speaker um, uh, may not like me saying this, but is, is a legendary figure, uh, Bill Kovacic, uh, uh, is, is currently a uh, global competition professor of law and policy at George Washington uh, Law School and director of the Competition Law Center. Uh, but as Rob has already uh, emphasized, is, is a, a, a leading um, international figure and a, a great uh, collaborator and I might say friend of the, the WTO program. Mm -hmm. uh, it, it, I'm tempted to, to uh, 
offer see, uh, great detail of, of, of people's CVs, but, uh, but uh, we want to hear from them and not from, from me. Uh, you can find their CVs uh, uh, in, in the book. <laughs> so uh, um, it, it's no disrespect to Bill, but to the opposite, that I, I now pass to Bill to, to hear his comments uh, uh, on the project and on his chapter. Thank you. Tony, it's a, it's a great honor to uh, participate in the launch, and I'm so grateful to, to you, to Rob and Nuno for convening this uh, excellent endeavor. I want to single out Rob as a co-author and to simply note that his extraordinary intelligence, experience, and generosity of spirit is a model to all of us who aspire to work in the field of international policy development. And I'm most grateful to the WTO, uh, Tony, to you and your colleagues for providing a forum in which the new talent of a new generation can emerge. Uh, Nadja, Anna Caroline, Antonella, who've assisted us, uh, you're helping to encourage the development of a good face for the future that gives us confidence in the way ahead. That didn't happen by accident, and I congratulate you for that major contribution as well. I want to emphasize five themes of our chapter. And in many respects, all of you in these excellent opening presentations have foreshadowed them. Five themes that Rob and I tried to underscore in looking at the evolution of thought about the links between competition policy and intellectual property. The first is the value of a historical perspective. Uh, 35 years ago, Ernest May and Richard Neustadt uh, produced a formative volume on public administration called Thinking in Time. This was designed to be a guide to policymakers about how to use history as a guide to developing policy going ahead. And their main intuition was that understanding policy developments in a larger context was vital to knowing the foundations for current policy but also understanding how to close the gap between what another legendary political scientist, Graham Allison has called, the distance between the idea and its realization and practice in public policy. And to know in particular the formative influences that have shaped developments and to use this as a way of understanding how to go ahead. And we have taken on that view in the chapter to provide that context as a way of understanding where we have been and to wrestle with complexity that we see in the field, uh, to avoid the tendency that perhaps non-historians, lawyers, economists, and others uh, have to seek the simple explanation. And we've tried to wrestle with the complexity and acknowledge the variety of forces that have shaped where we are so we can do an accurate diagnosis of the foundations for policy and perhaps to understand how best to take things forward. Our second theme was mentioned by Giovanni in his opening remark and also underscored by Tony just a moment ago. And that's the vital importance of interdisciplinary study as a foundation for doing policy here. That what we had to do to move ahead was to bring it together the disciplines, not simply of law and economics, but of competition law, and intellectual property, and indeed to bring the field of trade into the perspective as well. And that only by doing this could the groups as a whole identify myths that have emerged in the field in the past, to understand the areas of commonality, to see the strong complementarity between competition law and intellectual property, and to recognize tensions that persist, but because of the multidisciplinary perspective and the collective conversation to have a much better idea of how to take policy forward in a better state. Indeed, the formative 1995 United States Department of Justice and Federal Trade Commission intellectual property guidelines in so many ways reflected a joint venture of a prominent economist, Richard Gilbert, and a skilled competition law and intellectual property practitioner, Willard Tom. And the fusion of ideas could not have happened without that broader conversation, that perspective that Giovanni and Tony have mentioned. The third theme is the crucial importance for policy going ahead of having the right policy making team. 
to solve what Tony just referred to as the knowledge problem. And that is for a competition agency, for an intellectual property agency, it's not going to be sufficient to rely upon the skills of attorneys and economists, however wonderful their contributions might be. That the path ahead involves engaging engineers, scientists, bringing in practitioners who are aware of how new business models are unfolding. And in this respect, I highlight the work of the Competition and Markets Authority, where I serve as a non-executive director, and its wonderful creation in the past five years of a data team that is largely a complement of computer scientists, specialists in quantitative methods and analytics, a team that now numbers 40, as a way of bringing to bear on the analysis of the most difficult problems in this area, the full array of technical skills reflected in the book and certainly identified in our chapter as being essential foundations for good policymaking. Uh, a, a fourth uh, theme that comes through in our presentation is the significance of dynamism. Tony has just mentioned the significance of continuing change in the sector, breathtaking developments that unfold seemingly every day. And a necessary implication of this is the need for policymakers to engage in continuing assessment, not just a periodic five or 10 year stock taking, but an ongoing evaluation of what's working and what is not. And a research agenda carried out by academic institutions, by public authorities, that puts them in a position to understand better what's taking place and to upgrade the system on a regular basis. And that part of solving the knowledge problem indeed is a consultation with a wide variety of social, commercial, and government policymaking groups to understand what's taking place minute by minute and to know its importance and impact in the lives of the citizens whose jurisdictions are shaping policy. Another key theme mentioned also is the importance of comparative perspective. Uh, our chapter is deliberately comparative. We look at the experience of a number of different jurisdictions. And this is a recognition that in the face of vexing and difficult problems, we will invariably have a large degree of experimentation and diversification. And that diversification is healthy because when you're not entirely sure about what the answer is, you should probably try a number of different policy approaches. So that instead of regarding the fragmentation of policy as being a curse, we see it as an opportunity to learn. And we've tried to bring that to bear in the chapter. And indeed in the larger policy setting, we see an urgent priority to be to draw as much as we can upon the lessons accumulated across jurisdictions as a way of trying to identify better paths forward. A last lesson that we draw is the importance of assessment in the identification of promising methods. That is to take this diversified experimentation and again to extract from it important lessons. One of the themes of May and Neustadt 35 years ago in looking at policies to ask, is it working? Will it stick? And in key respects, this means a commitment on our parts to assessing outcomes and a regular consultation and evaluation of events. Even if that consultation and evaluation identifies things that have not succeeded, there is no shame in making errors in this field. Look at what we know about science, about technology, how often failure is an inevitable step in the direction of ultimate success and progress. And we do not shrink from discussing our failures. Instead, the aim is not to persist in them, but to learn how to do it better the next time. And here we underscore in our chapter, the importance of the international bodies, the WTO and WIPO. Where else are we going to carry on the conversation that Tony just mentioned? Where else are we going to develop the common understanding across disciplines and across nations? Where else are we going to have a chance to identify superior techniques? Because what we are seeking here are better practices, perhaps not best practices. To speak of best means an inevitable destination and finality 
we all realize that this is a journey where we're trying to improve over time. And I simply acknowledge and applaud the role that Tony, his colleagues at the WTO, and the larger international organizations play in providing an essential forum for that conversation and progress. And Rob and I, again, thank you for the opportunity to contribute to this endeavor. Thank you, Tony. Tony, you are muted. Apologies. The, the sound Tony, still is not working. Yeah. We cannot hear you, Tony. Is that any better? Can you hear me now? Yeah, we can hear you. So, uh, so that that. That piece of digital technology is uh, going to disappear in uh, Lac Le Mans, I think. Um, I've switched microphones. Excuse me, everyone. So, th Bill, uh, our th the thanks are very much due to you, as I've tried to say twice before. The thanks very much due to you. And uh, uh, and I would say, uh, for those who haven't read it, your your chapter with uh, with uh, with Rob is uh, a landmark. is is magisterial. It it it, it captures uh, the evolution of this area. In, in an extraordinary way, and, and uh, I, it's just irreplaceable. Uh, uh, so thank you very much. Now our, our next our next uh, speaker has has uh, been well introduced already by by a number of, of colleagues, um, and I'm, I'm going to uh, abbreviate her uh, CV introductions in, in interest of time. So I'll just mention that Anna Carol Muller has, has been uh, uh, working here in the uh, WTO in the Intellectual Property Government Procurement and Competition uh, Division, uh, and is one of our um, key and emerging experts uh, uh, in each of those fields. Uh, Anna, over to you. Thank you so much, Tony, and thanks uh, for this opportunity to say a few words. Many of you know that this is the first presentation I'm giving at the end of my maternity leave, and it's great to see so many friendly faces um, and regain this WTO WIPO family and community on uh, the interface of IP and competition. Um, I'm humbled to speak after so many illustrious panelists, including DDG Annabel Gonzalez, ADG Kwakwa, and of course the editors, and no international competition forum would be complete without Bill and Eleanor, I think. Um, and it was, of course, a true honor and pleasure to work on several of the chapters uh, with Tony, with Rob, with my other co-authors. And I'm glad that we're going to have presentations from Antonella and, and Nadia as well. My role today here is to focus and introduce on chapter three of the book, co-authored by Tony and Rob and myself. And it sets out the role of the TRIPS agreement as a platform for the application of competition policy to the contemporary knowledge economy. And in the interest of time, I'm really just going to focus on three essential points that this chapter brings out in my view. And um, the first one here, um, and I think all three points really are relevant in today's world where we're struggling with uh, a response to the COVID-19 crisis, and I'm going to come back to that. The first point has already been made, which is really the complementary nature of IP and competition policy. And this is explicitly recognized in the TRIPS agreement, as describes the chapter in, in, uh, in detail. Article 8.2 of the agreement acknowledges that WTO members may need to take appropriate measures to prevent the abuse of IPRs by right holders or the resort to practices with which unreasonably restrain trade or adversely affect the international transfer of technology. And we see important themes coming out here already. 
It brings out clearly that IP competition policy, trade and technology transfer are all interlinked and need to be addressed in a comprehensive and mutually supportive manner. And more concretely, Article 31K of the TRIPS Agreement, for example, addresses compulsory licensing as a means to remedy anti-competitive practices and it waives some of the requirements normally applicable to that, to make it easier and to make uh, trade also possible. Article 40 of the TRIPS Agreement provides more precise guidance concerning licensing practices which restrain competition and recognizes that they may have adverse effects on trade and impede the transfer and dissemination of technology, which is what we're working on. Um, so you s these are just quick examples and obviously the details are in the chapter. This is the first point that we have roots here and the complementary nature of IP competition policy and trade is deeply rooted in the TRIPS agreement. The other side of the medal and my second point um, is that this is just a starting point. It's a platform, as we say um, in the title, for discussions and policy solutions to address the interplay between IP competition and trade. And they are by no means meant or claimed to be an answer to all related questions. First, they are mostly permissive in nature and designed to provide flexibility to WTO members to apply existing competition law disciplines also to the area of IP. They do not impose minimum standards in this regard, whether related to the institutional setup needed for an effective competition policy response, uh, the standards to be applied in determining anti-competitive conduct or the remedies. And this is why I'm particularly glad that the book also includes additional chapters, many of them, of course. Um, but for example, one um, to be presented by Nadia Sporysheva in just a few minutes, um, a comparative one on competition agency guidelines on IP and competition policy that have been developed in different jurisdictions. And also the TRIPS agreement itself has, of course, been amended, for example, to address public health concerns. Yet by design, it does not frame that question in the competition policy context or contain provisions specifically on the competition policy aspects of uh, public health. And um, so again, there is uh, there are two, actually, specific chapters that look at competition policy angles and public health, and they're going to be presented by Antonella um, later on. Um, those of reverse patent settlements and product switching practices. And we see here that these are examples of topics where, again, the TRIPS agreement has a platform, it has some routes um, to start work on, but it doesn't, uh, of course, answer all the questions. And this brings me to the third aspect that, in my view, the chapter sheds light on, which is the development dimension of all these questions and the role the WTO as an institution has to play in providing a repository of information and knowledge and a forum for discussion. The chapter looks back to the negotiating history uh, of the TRIPS agreement and recalls that the inclusion of the above mentioned articles was very much a demand by developing countries. And Jeshri, who's also here, uh, can probably testify to that better than, than I can. Um, it also refers to country submissions that have been later, made later on as uh, countries have implemented the TRIPS agreement to the TRIPS Council, but also in the WTO more broadly, for example, in the framework of uh, trade policy review processes. And um, last but not least, in the past, to the working group on the interaction between trade and competition policy, which is now inactive. The materials are still there and, and can still uh, be used, of course. And all of these submissions provide a wealth of information on country implementation and experience, and also uh, the WTO as an institution uh, with its different committees um, and working groups can uh, provide a potential forum 
for discussion. To conclude, let me say again that I believe the current times are very much a testimony to the relevance of all of these questions. COVID-19 has shown that we need to be prepared at all times to very quickly develop and roll out integrated policy responses across policy areas that address IP, health and trade in the best possible ways and in order to create economic and competition outcomes that work in practice and are equitable from a developing um, from a development perspective. And in that regard, our new very energetic and visionary Director General Dr. Ngozi Okonjo Wela, um, I think has showed or shows an impressive way that the WTO uh, has convening powers and can be a very effective forum for uh, dialogue with members, for cooperation with other international organizations. And uh, this gives us all a lot of hope for the future, I think. Thank you. Thank, thank you very much, Anna. Uh, thank you very much for those, for those uh, comments and setting this broader context. Uh, I should have mentioned earlier that the, the, the sequence of speakers, in fact, um, is a very interesting mix of, um, of speakers, uh, but it's in fact roughly in the order of, of, the, of, the, of the chapters. And so we, we have a, um, an excellent um, uh, 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 interplay between um, academic, official, and, and uh, uh, policymaker uh, uh, observations. Our next speaker, uh, an old friend, uh, Professor Rohan Karawasan, who's a professor of law and director of research at Anglia Law School, Anglia Ruskin University. Very extensive uh, 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 academic uh, uh, background uh, with a, a long-standing interest in the legal implications, international implications of uh, uh, digital technology and, and, and information technology. So Ryan, wonderful to see you, uh, over to you. Thank you very much, Tony. I hope everybody can hear me well enough. Uh, we do, in fact, go back several years, back to the conference in Bern, the World Trade Institute, and I remember our conversations very well on the digital. Um, and thank you very much for Tony and the editors for uh, inviting me to contribute to this wonderful to this wonderful volume on IP and competitional law. Um, I mean, part one looks at setting the scene. Part two looks at sharpening the focus, the sectoral perspectives. Part three on deepening the dialogue, and part four on drawing the lessons. And this chapter on information and communication technologies, bridging the digital divide through the right mix of competition policy and IP, sits really within sharpening the focus, the look at sectoral perspectives. And actually, Tony, you know, you mentioned a little earlier the significance of the knowledge component. I think uh, William Kovacic also uh, touched on that. And that really therein lies the challenge. Um, the knowledge component in the digital economy and creating um, a challenge for those where more than 40% of the world's population has access to the internet, basically with new users coming online uh, every day. And among the poorest 20% of those households, as the data suggests, nearly seven out of 10 now have a mobile phone. So those are really quite alarming statistics or wonderful statistics in some respects. And yet the poorest households are more than likely to have access to mobile phones than having access to a toilet or to clean drinking water. And there is really, therein really lies the challenge. Uh, the international regulatory environment has seen considerable recent change, not only in, in relation to competition policy and IC, IP, but also significantly information, communication and technologies. And we hear every day of recent mergers and acquisitions between large telecom giants um, and content providers. And, and, and the regulators are always effectively playing catch up in that respect with the technology technologists. The recently concluded major regional trade agreements are likely to change that landscape further um, with the CPTPP, the Comprehensive and Progressive Agreement for Trans-Pacific Partnership, and um, the United States-Mexico-Canada agreement signed in 2018, both of which um, cover telecommunications, the digital environment on competition policy, data localization um, and IP. So really in, in terms of developing countries, and this is really my area, this is my interest area over the last two decades effectively. And I've seen you know, DCs and LDCs, both as an engineer 
and as a lawyer and involved in various privatization projects as well, have the opportunity to effectively leapfrog uh, the analog stages and directly integrate digital technology both at the core and periphery um, of their communication networks. And then the competitive need for FDI for foreign direct investment will be foremost for such countries in creating the right balance effectively between a favorable climate for FDI, but also in protecting health and employment rights um, of the domestic human capital base. In Kenya, for example, the cost of sending remittances has dropped by almost 90% the introduction of digital technologies, um, the MPISA system, the digital payment system, new technologies allowing women to participate more easily in the labor market as e-commerce entrepreneurs in online work or in business process outsourcing. And the world's one billion person with disabilities, that's 80% of whom live in developing countries, can lead more productive lives with the help of text, voice, and video comms. Digital ID systems can provide better access to public and private services uh, for the 2.4 billion people who lack formal identification records. So the data really is very much about the prevalence of, 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 of the digital economy um, and the effect that it's having on individual lives. The proliferation of broadband networks using cheaper and cheaper form, forms of transmission, uh, fiber optic cable, uh, and new forms of protocols such as the transmission control protocol or the internet protocol has led to lower costs for end users, no doubt, but also complex competition issues, and particularly where operators are bundling content with infrastructure and where ownership of both may rest with a single operator. Recent research indicates that the number of broadband connections obviously increases with the development of the economy. But how do we challenge, how do we mix, how do we, how do we address the balance with competition um, and, and IP? Um, with these fast-moving technology markets, particularly in areas, for example, such as privacy, um, as individual consumer data becomes aggregated, becomes valuable to operators with the increased growth of trade online. I mean, telecommunication operators are sitting on vast amounts of data. And now, with a number of jurisdictions putting in place uh, exceptions and limitations to copyright, for example, in the area of data mining, uh, text and data mining, we see new markets opening up in digital tools for textual analysis, um, but at the same time leading to market concentrations uh, with network concentration and content concentration ending up in the hands of single operators. Um, so this is where we can think about the network as being effectively a layered series of, of, of layers effectively. And if there's dominance at the lower layers, they could equally well be through joint venture or merger or acquisition concentrations in the content in the higher layers. And this is where really the challenge lies for balancing between IP frameworks and competition frameworks with that mix, that very rich mix um, of technological layering. We see a north-south divide developing in the technology for environmentally sound technology. WTO provisions allow developing countries and least developing countries to seek reductions in tariffs and the removal of unjustified non-tariff barriers. So this chapter tries to address some of those issues, the acquisition of environmentally sound technologies on the one hand, and pollution control um, and the measurement of, 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 of environmental um, um, uh, penetration on the other. Um, besides the use of competition law, balance IP rights, DCs and LDCs can directly intervene to help the imbalance between, for example, monopolies um, and developing country producers. A better approach might be to, to adopt, and the chapter argues this very much, um, a flexible ex post series of measures where we use competition policy on the one hand that can correct market failure, that's anti-competitive agreements that may have a material effect on the relevant market or abuse of a dominant position, for example, but can also reserve, reserve for the regulator ex post or ex ante or sector specific measures, situations where competition is difficult to apply. For example, in tariff setting, technology transfer, or tax provisions uh, affecting economic development zones. An example, um, I argue in this chapter, um, of a combined ex ante ex post approach is found, for example, in the European Commission's regulatory framework for electronic networks and services, where the EC combines competition powers of the national regulatory authorities in monitoring markets. And here, the monitoring function becomes so much more significant 
with dynamic temporal markets. So again, the use of AI or predictive analytics to accurately measure market power at the, la at the level of the network, at the, at the level of the individual layer within the network. This can you know, fundamentally deliver information for regulators, which is so valuable in effectively measuring market share. Um, and so the European Commission's framework in using this kind of dynamic regulatory framework, dynamic regulatory um, set of conditions, both ex ante and ex post, um, is in my view, a wonderful way of looking at regulating operators such as Google, for example, in time to come. So what is distinctive in applying these measures to the ITC sector is that law must be dynamic. Often the technology involved changes more rapidly than the law. And traditional common law regulatory frameworks have been more flexible in addressing these changes. For instance, in the UK, serious work has been undertaken by the courts um, and government policy um, in the area of blockchain, for example, defining or not whether a digital asset can be classed um, as an intangible property and be regulated. Um, China and Russia have also made uh, advances with regulatory frameworks in this area of blockchain. So addressing these issues will help both address the international digital divide, but also the domestic divide. And as Jim Yong Kim, the former president of the World Bank, has argued, while people around the world make more than 4 billion Google searches every day, 4 billion people still lack access to the internet. And the greatest rise of information communications in history will not be truly revolutionary until it benefits everyone in every part of the world. So thank you very much, Tony um, and editors, for, for uh, inviting me to contribute this chapter to this wonderful piece, uh, to this wonderful book, and hopefully um, the other um, uh, discussants will be able to discuss their chapters, or some of them in more detail. Thank, thank you very much, Rohan, and, and thank you indeed for reminding us too that uh, this digital technology that we like complaining about is indeed a, a luxury uh, that uh, we're, we're very privileged to, to benefit from. Uh, and indeed supporting this very conversation. Uh, of all the speakers who I have to say, uh, they need no introduction. Uh, I think the next one is at the top of the list. Um, Jayashri Watol is um, uh, a former TRIPS negotiator, has worked here in the WTO uh, until recently for, for many years uh, and uh, is currently uh, honorary professor at the National Law University here in New Delhi. Uh, but uh, of course, a, a lead, leading international expert uh, on international uh, IP and, and the policy context. Uh, so Jayashri, uh, looking forward to hearing from you as ever. Thank you. You need to come off mute, I think, Jayashri then. Right. Thanks Got very you. much, Tony. Uh, Thank you also to uh, you, Rob and me, Nuno for editing this very massive book project and for the wonderful contributions you've made. I mean, those chapters uh, are going to take me a lifetime to read and understand. Uh, this is a massive, massive project. Thanks also to Reto for his brilliant moderation, to Giovanni for uh, standing in for Nuno, Nadia, other colleagues for bringing this event together and for inviting me. Thanks, Tony, so for inviting me to, to be here. I'd like to begin by, by acknowledging uh, that Professor Mike Scherer, my co-author, uh, did really much of the heavy lifting for our chapter. Mike, as uh, most of you might know, uh, is a famous American economist working at the Harvard Kennedy School. And he's really, he's really famous for his seminal contributions to industrial organization. And competition policy and the interface between competition and IP has really been very close to his heart for all the years uh, that he's worked uh, in the economics of intellectual property. So this very important uh, book is, uh, is really a must have on the table of all or bookshelves of all policymakers, particularly those in developing countries dealing with intellectual property and competition policy. And while it's been said that IP and competition policy go in the same direction, they have the same or complementary goals and so on, we need to acknowledge, as some speakers have done before me, 
that there continue to be tensions in this area. Now, for developing countries who, by and large, do not produce uh, the, they are not net technology exporters, with some exceptions. Uh, the, these tensions, the, the tensions between IP and competition policy, are uh, are extremely important to bear in mind. And while it's well known, as Anna has explained, uh, that there are TRIPS provisions on this interface between IP and competition. These are permissive, as uh, Rob and others have said, and they don't really spell out much detail or they don't prescribe um, you know, any detailed rules. But what is less known is how they came in uh, to the TRIPS agreement. And since I was there representing India in the TRIPS negotiations, I, I'd like to just explain a little bit about that. So what's really not known uh, very widely is that developing countries really agreed to the section eight, uh, which is uh, the section on anti-competitive practices um, in return uh, for agreeing to section seven on undisclosed information. Uh, which was on trade secrets and test data protection and so on. So it was really quite a big give. I mean, all negotiations about, are about give and take, but uh, developing countries were certainly uh, in a weak position uh, in the TRIPS negotiations in the Uruguay round at that time. And I'm talking about 1990, which is a long time back. So we as developing country negotiators in the Uruguay round, we built upon or we tried to build upon the work in UNCTAD, which was done decades earlier in UNCTAD on the International Code for Transnational Corporations. Now, this code really uh, uh, died unceremoniously, didn't see the light of day. But I believe, I truly believe uh, that um, the topic, I mean, at least the subject of restrictive business practices, licensing practices, got a new life, got a new life, even if it was partial, even if uh, developing country negotiators didn't gain all that much through these provisions in Article 8, 31, and 40. I think what came together uh, were, were important enough for, uh, for developing countries to recognize, I would say, uh, that there, there are some conditions in IP licenses of which only three examples were accepted in, uh, in the text, finally, in Article 40. Uh, but there are such conditions. And the UNCTAD code, of course, contained 14 uh, restrictive, what they, were, they were called restrictive business practices at that time. And, uh, and we based ourselves on these 14 and fought hard to get those 14. We got only three, as you know, as examples. Uh, but the key, the, key uh, the key debate or difference between the North and the South, I would say, uh, war, war, was around the subject of whether we can have per se licensing practices, which are considered per se to be anti-competitive until proven not to be so, or uh, whether it should only follow the rule of reason approach, which is how uh, the sophisticated competition policy jurisdictions such as the US and the, and the European Union had, had moved to. And they had actually moved uh, later on, I mean, uh, quite late in their application of competition policy away from the per se uh, provisions. So all in all, I think the TRIPS negotiations and the very fact that something was included in the TRIPS negotiations on the interface between competition policy and IP, I think uh, it kicked off an interest in, uh, in competition policy in the developing world um, overall, and in particular among IP delegates, I would say, to the WTO as well as the WIPO and other intergovernmental organizations. And these issues have come up in negotiations, uh, uh, which are or in discussions, um, uh, in these, in different organizations. And we've had some pretty well-informed debates on these issues during the WIPO development agenda, for example, and also in the TRIPS Council, uh, which is well-documented in uh, some of the chapters in this, uh, in this book. So 
when we were writing, when we were conceiving this chapter, we thought, Mike and I, that uh, we, we should provide some guidance to developing countries, uh, which is based on the early experience in developed countries. And, and then see, you know, from where developed countries kind of became more sophisticated on these issues and went further. So I'll just quote our conclusion just for you to get a flavor of uh, what we were trying to say. What we conclude is, uh, and I quote, what our findings suggest is that developing countries, like the developed countries on which we have mainly focused, can reasonably choose among a broad menu of policy alternatives as their national interests dictate. Obviously, even among developing countries, there are, this is an aside, even among developing countries, there are uh, countries at different levels of development, particularly if you take the WTO definition of developing countries, which includes Singapore, for instance, or, uh, or uh, South Korea. Now to continue with the quote, developing countries need precedence that enable their enterprises to absorb on reasonable terms the technologies that will facilitate their growth. And they, they might be well advised to favor appropriately nuanced per se rules distilled from the experience of technologically advanced countries as South Africa has done, for example, in its section 8A of its competition law, rather than adopting a rule of reason approach with the attendant attorney and expert consultant costs and delays required to balance complex conflicting facts and values." End of quote. Now, we recognize that nothing can really be per se in the sense that there are no exceptions. No, it can't be like that. But what we are trying to say here is if you had some administrative or, or legislative guidance for developing countries in competition law, which would tell them, look, look more carefully if there are these kind of problems that come up, because we know historically that these are the kind of problems where they could uh, end up uh, being anti-competitive. These are the kind of practices which could end up uh, kind of lowering the competition so or obstructing competition. So, uh, so they just need guidance because Developing countries, many of them, I mean, some of them are extremely sophisticated now at this stage, as the chapter uh, which Nadia is going to talk about uh, will show. Uh, there are some, but not all. A lot of them are just starting out. I mean, you know, 130 jurisdictions have competition law. Not all of them are at the same level. That's quite clear. So they need some guidance. And why not start with some, some presumptions which can, of course, be rebutted? So rebuttable presumptions, that kind of thing. And I still believe, uh, despite, of course, uh, you know, all the arguments to the contrary, that uh, when you're beginning uh, down the road of applying competition law, it's good to have some clear administrative guidance, uh, which help the authorities, uh, which have to adjudicate, adjudicate on these very complex issues. So I'll, I'll end with that. And thank you again for giving me the time. Thank you very much, Tony. Thank you, uh, as, as ever, Jayashree, and, and uh, uh, thanks also for r reminding us of your co-author, uh, uh, who, who's an absolute uh, leading uh, uh, literary figure in, in the field, and, and, uh, and yet uh, uh, Mike Shira, with you, has, has uh, framed issues in, in a very important contemporary way, and, and a reminder too, taking up what, what Bill has said, that we're not yeah, look, looking to frame one sort of simple set of uh, supposed best practices, but rather learn from one another and and, and develop better practices. Uh, and I think you've charted out, you know, an interesting way of, of achieving that. Um, our next speaker, uh, a leading uh, intellectual property um, scholar uh, internationally, uh, and uh, uh, I'm, I'm glad to say we, we wanted to make sure that this volume uh, looked at uh, intellectual property in, in, a, in a broader sense. Uh, we tend to focus on patents when talking about the competition overlap. Uh, William Van Kanigan, who's a professor of law at Bond University in Australia with a long uh, uh, academic uh, pedigree, 
his, his chapter is a really invigorating piece, th encouraging us to rethink about, uh, about uh, the competition aspects of, of trademark law. So, William, uh, gladly over to you, and thanks for joining us at such a late hour. Yeah, thank you. Thank you very much, Tani. Well, um, and thank you very much also to, to Robert and to Nuno, who's not here, um, for uh, involving me in this uh, book. Um, and um, it's been very interesting, even though, yes, it's about uh, five minutes to midnight here in Queensland, but it's been very interesting to hear all the other speakers and see you know, some of the others involved in, uh, in the book. That's been great. Um, I've, I've always had a great interest in this connection between IP and competition. And sometimes I like to put it to, to students in class that really IP uh, is a form of regulating of competitive conduct and to think about it a little bit like that. Um, so that the different areas of IP are different ways in which we actually regulate uh, competitive conduct. Um, I've uh, found very interesting aspects in, in the book also uh, this um, trying to break out of silos, which is mentioned before, I think, by the DDG uh, Gonzalez. Um, in particular, between econ economists and lawyers. Uh, I'm not an economist, but I, as a lawyer, do try and um, read economics literature and, and try to derive messages from that and lessons from that. And I've tried to do this in this chapter. Um, I've also been um, quite interested in, in trademark for a long time, but also in GIs and uh, geographical indications. And, and as we're all aware, the sort of um, the, uh, competitive competition effect of GIs has been a very hot topic in, in, in that sort of context. But I'll just very briefly speak a little bit about what I try to emphasize in my chapter. Uh, it, it examines the impact of the settings of trademarks law on competition. Um, and I argue basically, as, as Tony has perhaps pointed out, that trademarks law uh, can constitute, and the settings of trademarks law can constitute a more significant barrier or break on competition uh, than hitherto has perhaps been recognized. Uh, as Tony said, the focus has been a lot on patents and perhaps some other areas of IP, not so much on trademarks. Um, so for me, this was an opportunity to draw attention to the fact that there are competition issues in trademarks law. Um, and in fact, interest in the competition effect of trademarks law has waxed and waned over time, but in recent times has perhaps been um, been quite low. So for me, this is an opportunity of, uh, for bringing this topic to the fore again, and I thank you for giving me that opportunity. Uh, so um, I focus in particular on the impact of trademarks law on markets for consumer goods. Um, many such markets have major incumbents in them. Um, and the power, their power is made visible through their trademarks or through their brands. Um, to most consumers, uh, trademarks look like the sign of market power. If, if consumers come into contact, if you like, with markets in a conscious way, it's through seeing brands and seeing big brands uh, all around them and seeing big brands all the time. Uh, brands are ubiquitous and a constant reminder to uh, consumers of um, the uh, of certain competitors' presence in the market. So, if you think about it in a very simple, at a very simple level, then trademarks, brands, if you like, do uh, visibly represent uh, uh, market power, market presence. Many brands, uh, well-known consumer brands, are very ubiquitous, and then that's a uh, sense very strong. Well, that's not a very scientific observation, but it to me was a little, uh, an, an interesting one, um, which kind of uh, inspired me a little. Uh, the power of these marks uh, that these marks have, or that brands have over consumers, um, their loyalty over their allegiance of consumers, is really a major obstacle to new entrants, in my view. Um, the big brands build very strong allegiance um, and that allegiance or that loyalty is really what makes it difficult for new entrants to enter those uh, market segments, put it uh, like that. Um, in my chapter, I first examine uh, traditional trademark theory, a bit in particular focus on uh, Lanz and Posner law and economics view 
that the main benefit of protecting trademarks uh, against misuse is their information function, as the information function is the search cost redu reduction function of uh, trademarks. Reliable trademarks reduce search costs for consumers. Uh, they overcome the information asymmetry in, uh, in a market in an efficient manner. Uh, and that's seen in traditional theory as their major advantage and a good reason, therefore, to protect the integrity of trademarks, the distinctiveness of trademarks, um, and to protect trademarks against misuse. Because if you don't do that, then that information, information function is undermined, if you like. Um, that's the traditional theory. I analyze that and I critique that theory um, in my chapter, and I point out that uh, trademarks aren't just tools to inform of information of consumers, they are also tools for persuasion of consumers. Um, in particular, trademarks um, uh, um, help brand owners build consumer loyalty through advertising and promotion. That's really the core kind of dynamic in competition uh, that is uh, at work, um, that the brand owners use promotion, advertising, and often very big spends on those to build the loyalty of consumers. Um, that is very sticky then. Uh, it makes it difficult um, for consumers to then transition to other brands. Um, that advertising and promotion, of course, doesn't just work on the rational mind of the welfare maximizing consumer that economists like to imagine and, and law academics perhaps also like to then adopt. Um, the advertising and promotion efforts of brand owners tend to work at the emotional, psychological, more sentimental kind of level rather than at the level of rational information sharing. Uh, so in that sense, too, brands, trademarks are a way of, in effect, building the loyalty um, subliminally often of uh, consumers to brands. Um, this loyalty um, uh, can, um, uh, that incumbent brands can build is the very strong barrier to entry that can potentially be a competition issue. And that's really the core kind of uh, theme of my, uh, my chapter. So um, that means that brands um, that have that, have built that loyalty through advertising, et cetera, um, that not loyalty can have a negative effect on dynamic competition because it can make it very difficult for new entrants to dislodge that loyalty uh, that consumers have to existing brands of incumbents uh, by making their own investments in advertising and promotion. Um, new entrants will often have a lot of difficulty to match the spend of the incumbents um, with market power um, and who have a, a reasonable level of control over prices, etc. New entrants will very often find it difficult to match that spend and therefore dislodge the loyalty uh, and allegiance of consumers from those incumbent brands and shift it to their own brands. And that's really where you can see that trademarks law uh, comes in um, and the settings of trademarks law and the policy you adopt in relation to trademarks law um, play an important uh, role. My argument is simply that um, trademarks law and those who think about its settings and policy to, the, to, to pursue in, in um, the detail of the law should be conscious of this, more conscious perhaps than has been the case in recent times, of this potential uh, for trademarks of incumbents in markets uh, to really uh, constitute a barrier to new entrants through that loyalty that can be built through um, a considerable advertising spend. So, um, so we should keep the potential effect on dynamic competition of uh, strong trademarks law in mind, and more generally of the settings of trademarks law in mind um, uh, when we think about uh, these issues. Um, my chapter then is, examines in a little bit more detail some of the specific uh, issues in trademarks law where 
this type of uh, issue can be reflected. So in terms of protection and the test of distinctiveness, in terms of infringement, in terms of remedies, such as the controversial uh, remedy, uh, the anti-dilution remedies, uh, trademark use, non-infringing uses, descriptive uses, generic uses of trademarks, mm. etc. So my chapter looks at all these specific aspects of trademarks law from the perspective that I've just tried to uh, pick, uh, paint for you um, uh, in relation to its potential effect on dynamic competition uh, and um, barriers to entry to new entrants. Uh, I won't go into that now. Um, but it's just not, not the time for that. And uh, some of it is very uh, complex and rather um, densely argued, I suppose. Um, so I would just um, like to uh, end on that note. Um, and again, um, I think it was Giovanni who mentioned uh, that really IP is about dynamic con uh, competition. It's about competition through substitution. Um, and that is absolutely key to, to keep in mind. And it plays out then in this uh, area of trademarks law that I've had the pleasure to write this uh, chapter on. So again, I'd like to thank you, uh, Tony, uh, in particular, and also the other editors for giving me a chance to air these ideas. Um, I understand stood that to be the purpose of, of the book, to, to do some such things. And I've really enjoyed uh, having a go at that and um, being included in, in the work. So thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you very much indeed, uh, William. And again, thanks for, for um, those thoughts uh, so late at night where you are. Uh, I have some good news for, for, uh, for everyone. Um, uh, because we are running over time somewhat, uh, you'll be spared my, my closing uh, uh, remarks. Um, but uh, the, the trade-off is that we, we, we are running out of time uh, for, we have four more, four more speakers. So I, I, I will keep my introductions brief and I will invite speakers to uh, uh, really focus on, on their key points. Um, and above all, don't thank the editors, they've had enough, uh, thanks. Next uh, uh, speaker is a key key person in, in this whole process and uh, Nadia Sparasheva, who is working with us here in the WTO and uh, for a, a, a young emerging uh, expert in the field has had very wide experience already. Nadia, over to you. Thanks very much, uh, Tony, for the opportunity to join this panel, but I still want to thank uh, Europe and Nuno for the opportunity to work on this project in general. Uh, this book has been a labor of love for all of us, as many of you mentioned, and uh, this, in fact, has been uh, my first project that I joined the WTO in 2016. And I am extremely thrilled to see that uh, this volume is uh, finally in print. As foreshadowed by DDG Gonzalez, Tony and Rob, the book has an important cross-jurisdictional and comparative focus. One of the chapters, chapter 17, so-called comparative chapter, authored by several of my current and former WTO colleagues of diverse national backgrounds, maps the competition policy treatment of IP rights and evolution of policy thinking across 11 jurisdictions. This includes both developed economies, which have a long history and tradition as discussed by Professor Kavasik, but as well, this chapter focuses on emerging BRICS economies, where the related policy thinking is still evolving. This is an important novelty of this chapter. Our cross-jurisdictional analysis in this chapter reveals that interest in maintaining an appropriate balance between competition policy and IP is not longer a focus of only few mainly developed economies, but rather this interest has migrated across emerging economies and has become an important part of ongoing policy work, both in the context of digital economy as well as public health issues. Another novelty of this chapter is the range of instruments that we looked at. This includes competition policy guidelines, policy statements, related advocacy initiatives, and as well to some extent enforcement activities. Yet another important element of this chapter is that it addresses both traditional issues 
such as treatment of licensing practices, including refusals to license, but as well new emerging areas, such as anti-competitive pattern settlements, standard essential patents and pattern assertion entities. And Antonella will speak about some of these emerging issues in more detail just in a minute. In comparison of policy initiatives on these traditional and emerging areas show significant degree of cross-jurisdictional learning and convergence on key policy issues. This transition in many instances from per se to rule of reason approach. And in fact, regional cooperation and integration has played an important role in this process. At the same time, the proliferation of guidelines and policy initiatives also carries the potential for interjurisdictional conflicts and coordination failures. For example, where jurisdictions take differing approaches to specific practices, such as refusals to license, or give different weights to industrial policy as opposed to consumer welfare or other objectives in their policy applications. Given these significant developments that I just spoke about, we come to an important question and also foreshadowed by Professor Kovacic and some other authors, do we need a greater degree of coordination, whether voluntary or otherwise concerning these policy issues and initiatives. I believe that some of the authors, including Professor Fox, will share their reflections on this, and I'm very much looking forward to it. Thank you very much, Tony. Thank you very much, uh, Nadja, and thank you also for all of the work you've done uh, in bringing this book to fruition, as well as your scholarly contribution. Uh, uh, our, our next speaker also, uh, a, 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 an illustrious alumna from our, from our division here in the WTO, uh, now Secretary General of, uh, of the ICC, the International Trade of Commerce in, in Paraguay, uh, and uh, a, a very active uh, IP lawyer and scholar. Antonella Sagiaro, over to you. Thank you, Tony. And it is my pleasure to, and honor to share today's virtual launch of the book with this great panel and fellow contributing authors to briefly comment on some of the chapters. But first, I have to thank Rob, you and Nuno for providing me the opportunity of being part of the exceptional project. In particular, the draft of the chapter explores certain practices and regulatory concerns in the pharma industry, mostly relating to patents and how these can be used or better said, misused to store generic entry, generic uh, restrict competition and overall impede generic, uh, general access to affordable medicines. Uh, in the chapters, first, we demystify the old notion that IP and competition law are divergent and even contradictory. As mentioned earlier by Rob and Anna, IP most often serves a, as a pro-competitive pro functions. In fact, both are very much complementary legal constructs which strive for further innovation, growth, and welfare. Indeed, what is actually necessary is to balance the potential monopoly created by patents on the one hand, and the need to reward investment on the other considering that only a minority of pharmaceutical drugs are actually successes in the market. These notions need to be carefully regarded, considering that the sensibility of the pharma sector and existing public policy goals, as this market itself is at the crossroads between health, IP, competition, and trade policy. In this sense, in our research, we look into both potential anti-competitive practices in the pharma industry and related existing regulatory regimes, across a set of jurisdictions, including not only those regarded as forerunners on competition issues, but also in emerging and developing economies. Some of these practices are reverse payment patent settlements, also known as pay for delay agreements. Also, we look into product switching or product hopping and the practice of evergreening patents through minimal variations. In these chapters, besides going through landmark cases that pretty much set the tone for the existing analysis criteria, we also ponder a new, a new question, and which is, do the characteristics of the pharmaceutical markets and existing regulatory mechanisms, including those that seek to ensure generic market entry, market entry will actually serve as enablers facilitating anti-competitive practices? Indeed, some of the elements of the systems created to encourage generic entry may actually facilitate collusion or restrict competition in the market. For instance, um, let's take into account the provided exclusivity period for first generic profilers in the US, which could facilitate insider information as well as an umbrella under which pay for delay agreements could flourish. 
In the case of product switching, it is relevant to explore where the IP system and lax patent identity requirements in some jurisdictions could actually facilitate the scheme of replacing the brand name drug with slightly reformulated second generation drugs. Reflecting on these practices, it becomes relevant to ponder where it is necessary to evaluate existing patentability requirements, especially in relation to the pharma products, while also considering that such action could at the same time impair innovation and dynamic efficiency. So here, this is the crossroad we are examining. In this context, application of competition law might be essential as an instrument to compensate for failures of the IP and related regulatory framework and to correct abuses in the market. Competition may also serve to distinguish between investment in innovation versus investment in impairing competition. Thus, for this purpose, a combination of an adjusted regulatory framework, public policy, and advocacy may serve to create a more competitive market. Overall, to sum up, the competition enforcement is a strong instrument to counteract market abuses. Still, advocacy and market surveillance activities are vital to preserve a healthy balance vis-a-vis -vis IPRs and existing competition public policy goals in the pharma sector. In addition, international dialogue is also encouraged. This does not mean that unified or uniform criterion is, is warranted, but it actually becomes necessary to promote a degree of jurisdictional cross-fertilization and peer learning as issues related to IP and competition are no longer the preoccupation of just a few jurisdictions. Finally, the wider context must be also taken into account, considering the existing and sometimes diverging public health and trade objectives, as we cannot discuss competition and its interactions with IP without considering the trade and commercial effects in the market, especially since some of these issues have cross-border effects. To this end, and to finalize, I would like to end by saying that the WTO could actually serve in the future, as, a, as mentioned by Anna, as an appropriate forum to continue the conversation related to the intersection of IP, competition, competition and trade-related matters. Thank you, and back to you, Tony. Thank you, and Antonella, and certainly uh, your, your work in the, in the book has given us plenty that we can talk about if, if there's a desire to take it forward, that's, that's for sure. Uh, I'm, I'm delighted to uh, introduce our next speaker, Jay Kesson, who's a uh, professor of law and, and uh, Ross and Helen Workman research scholar at the University of uh, Illinois in uh, Urbana, which means that he's um, uh, confronting a very early morning start. So we thank you very much, Jay, for, for joining us. Uh, over to you. Thank you, Jay. Um, good afternoon, everyone. Um, thank you, Rob, uh, Nuno, and Tony for putting together a Terrific volume. Uh, it's really come together very nicely and uh, um, wonderful accomplishment um, in this very vital uh, topic uh, in the world of IP. From my perspective, um, um, someone else might say from the world of competition policy, but nevertheless, it's, uh, it's a terrific volume. Um, and um, I'm very pleased to talk a little bit about uh, my chapter, chapter nine on uh, uh, standard setting organizations, uh, standard essential patents, uh, and FRAN licensing, uh, uh, co-authored with my uh, colleague, Carol Hayes. Um, it was wonderful when I looked back at the chapter in preparation for this talk to see that uh, a lot of the introduction and the issues that I've highlighted in the chapter is actually uh, um, of continuing vitality and, uh, and indeed topics of uh, current debate. <clears throat> Fran licensing, of course, is uh, uh, becoming even more important with uh, network technologies uh, becoming more and more and more a part of our lives, whether it's uh, from the obvious uh, 5G technologies, 4G LT, all the way to uh, more emerging areas um, like electric vehicle electric vehicle charging and infrastructure and uh, internet of things and so on and so forth. So what we're actually seeing is a greater reliance on standards and a greater reliance on uh, using standards to develop technology and to implement and disseminate technology. Uh, so a lot of the initial issues uh, continue to be uh, tremendously important. I want to just highlight a couple of them. Um, for instance, it was initially thought that the entire concept of FRAND, there was no place for injunct injunctive relief in that uh, sort of arrangement, uh, where you basically had, um, you know, the implementers the, um, and the SCP owners striking a compromise. No one got to play 
uh, you know, so to speak, hold out or um, uh, so on and so forth. Um, and, um, you know, they agreed that, hey, we would license these technologies on fair, reasonable and uh, non-discriminatory terms. Uh, what we have seen in the past few years is that actually that has not been the case. And that was uh, uh, something that we actually discussed in the chapter that we think that uh, there might still be a role for uh, injunctive relief. And that's uh, been the case. Uh, going all the way back to the 2017, um, so, you know, President and setting decision in the UK courts of, you know, on White Planet versus Huawei, where essentially, you know, the uh, uh, parties were told that, hey, you know, you're going to be enjoined from entering the UK if you don't uh, agree to a global friend rate and setting out all these rates in all these jurisdictions. Um, and uh, today, what we're seeing is more and more of the role of injunctions as a way to uh, coerce the parties uh, to kind of come together and, and you know, understand that, uh, uh, you know, the issues need to be resolved, um, you know, and coming up with basically what is a reasonable friend rate. Um, in fact, uh, this whole notion of global friend has sort of taken on a uh, sort of um, tremendous importance where you're now seeing courts in the past couple of years, in China and other places where the courts have sort of stepped in and basically said, hey, you know, um, well, we believe that it makes sense for um, some of these tribunals to sort of, you know, essentially go beyond their jurisdiction <laughs> and, 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 you know, set these global rates. And we saw, of course, the Unwide Planet decision was affirmed by the UK Supreme Court um, um, towards the end of last year. Uh, so if anything, what we're seeing is this whole notion of a global friend, and particularly in the, uh, in the context of a big market like China, as opposed to a small market or relatively smaller market like the UK, uh, it, it, it's, it's even more important. And and, what, and, and China is a particularly interesting situation because you see um, SCP owners um, like Huawei and ZTE and, of course, a huge number of implementers. And so it's going to be interesting to see, you know, are we going to see the kind of friend rates of 0.01 to 0.02 percent, uh, which a number of uh, standard essential patent owners have complained about, or as we start seeing more SEP owners assert um, their uh, the role um, in, in um, the major jurisdictions, uh, whether it's um, you know, US, China, Europe, so on, um, where that turns out. Um, there was also a second, um, a few years ago, there was a second uh, sort of a corollary to the disappointment with, with, with FRAN licensing that perhaps low FRAN rates might actually cause SAP owners to quote unquote flee <laughs> or exit uh, the uh, FRAN licensing construct. And that is not happened. In fact, if anything, it has become even more important. And, and what we've seen is that uh, it's really a debate of um, continuing vitality with more issues. Um, and in fact, more areas where issues are being brought up, such as the notion of essentiality. When is a particular patent actually, quote unquote, essential to the standard? Uh, is it essential to the core standard? Is, is, is it essential to a option? So how widely adopted is the option? All of these issues have sort of become uh, taken on tremendous importance as we start questioning to what does a friend licensing term attach to. Uh, along the same lines, we have situations where you have after acquired patents, where you have a licensing commitment, you have a friend licensing commitment, but then you have newer patents being brought in to that framework. And does the friend commitment attach? And in what circumstances does it attach? Um, we're also having more debates about whether SSOs like Etsy and so on, in the first instance, should have embraced the role of setting these global friend rates, something that they've sort of, for competition policy reasons, they've been very uh, disinclined to do. And the question is whether they're actually understanding the technology well, and, and with, given their own expertise, and given the stakeholders participating actively in the process, should, in fact, we have a situation where uh, there are certain recommended rates, so on and so forth, uh, that might actually be set at the outset. So what we're really seeing, in short, is 
that the transactional efficiencies that come about from having a FRAND system as a way of bringing SCP owners, innovators, and implementers together is, is really alive and well. Uh, and the transactional efficiencies uh, from that process uh, are, are actually um, sort of forcing the parties to um, maintain the system. Um, and I'll stop right here. Um, um, thank you again very much for uh, giving me the opportunity to share a few of my thoughts this morning and uh, this morning here uh, uh, in Illinois, uh, this afternoon in uh, Geneva and uh, back to you, Tony. Thank, thank you, Jay. That, that was wonderful. I mean, uh, you, you've packed an enormous amount of, of really topical, uh, cutting-edge content uh, uh, into, into your comment. Uh, reminded us of the, the great salience of your of your of your piece in the book, uh, and also, you know, the the inevitability now of, of um, spillover, extraterritorial extraterritorial spillover, which uh, at least for us sitting here in Geneva. Uh, suggest, well, um, some degree of international coordination or, or at least dialogue uh, might be helpful. And this therefore serves as an excellent segue to our, 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 our final speaker, who is the final speaker because her chapter is so significant in uh, talking about the way forward. Uh, uh, and uh, uh, again, uh, I'm a bit embarrassed introducing someone who needs absolutely no introduction to this, this, this uh, community, but uh, Eleanor Fox is uh, Walter Derenberg, Professor of Trade Regulation at New York University School of Law, uh, but also has, has a very rich uh, uh, background as, as a uh, leading um, practitioner in the field and, and as a scholar. Uh, Eleanor, it's, it's with the immense privilege uh, that we, we pass to you and uh, looking forward to your comments on, as you've said, uh, uh, edging towards the future. Uh, so let's, let's see what the future holds. Thank you, Eleanor. Uh, thank you very much, uh, Tony. Thank you so much, Rob. All of you wonderful people, presenters, thinkers about the future of trade, competition, intellectual property, innovation, markets, etc. The book is wonderful. This program has been very inspiring. Um, what I want to do in my few minutes is I'm going to try to pull together some of the threads of what I've heard today and make a suggestion for the future, for, for all of you and us thinking about how to get there. Uh, so I want to do a little bit of very quick history, bringing us to where we are today, and then to pass to what I think we ought to do. Before I do that, uh, just a background comment on interface between competition and intellectual property. I want to broaden that notion, and I think you all have broadened the notion. The interface is not just a horizontal thing of here and now. We need the roots. We also need the concepts. All of you, we need the roots to grow under a roof of a common concept. And so it's not just competition here, intellectual property here, and how do we make them in the particular case work together, which we have to do, but it is more a pyramid, a tip of the iceberg, lift the gaze, and we actually all want basically, I think, the same thing, um, which is in our fields, our joint fields, making markets work better and work better for the people, including innovation, including making consumers better off, including um, making producers having opportunity and access, including people having access to health, innovation, knowledge, et cetera, um, including as, as Rowan and Jaya Shri have so importantly noted, um, and it's very clear in digital economy, um, put the developing country's interests into the picture. So here's my little very quick, um, history. We were brainstorming 
most of us, all of us who were there at the time in the 1990s, we were brainstorming, especially in the context of the WTO, towards a more coherent vision of a more cosmopolitan world that would take all of these interests into account and try to get rid of narrow nationalism and parochialism. And WTO was the focus and competition was one of the possible agendas and the competition agenda has now stalled. Um, why has the cosmopolitan vision stalled? It has stalled, this is very unfortunate. Um, since the 1990s, we've had elements and incidents in the world that pushed back the effort um, financial crisis being one of them, the particular politics of a number of countries being another one where countries got extremely nationalistic, um, parochially nationalistic, uh, so that now it is actually very hard to move ahead for countries to move ahead on a common vision that would actually help all of us in the world. I read an article last week by Adam Tooze, an op-ed in the New York Times that was called, what if the coronavirus is a trial run? And this was not just coronavirus. The whole idea is there actually was a better solution for the world that nobody took and the developing countries didn't take. And the developing countries being, developed countries being so protective about keeping their vaccine for their people, even if it's more than they needed, being selfish about looking at the world problem, distributing the vaccine to the world, getting the world immune, better for everyone to get the world immune, but we could not come to international agreement on what is good for the world. I find this a call, a call for um, thinking as this group can think about next steps to reach a common vision that is not a selfish vision. While we move towards populism, also we saw inequalities increasing. Um, we saw as Many of you have mentioned the silos, we don't talk to each other. We saw tit for tat in the international environment. And meanwhile, we have greater international economic problems than we've ever had before and clearer need for cosmopolitan or coherent vision when we have such big tech, big merger, big power, big pharmas unleashed. And for competition, we have only national law. Um, in the competition area, it is very interesting that while on the higher level, there seems such frustration, on the level of thinkers, there has been a revolution in thought about new forms of power breaking out that need to be controlled and how can they be controlled? And can they be controlled by a new vision of competition policy that is meet for this new age? This includes tech, it includes um, AI, it always includes competition and intellectual property because they are part of the same ball of wax. So while the planet is moving towards some very perverse modes, I think there is more of a need than ever for thinkers such as within the WTO and WIPO um, to take a next step. What do we want? We want greater coherence. We want peace. As Rob said at the outset, we want equitable progress. And yet we're faced with externalities, fragmentation, lack of vision, lack of community, and lack of a notion of world welfare. So how to solve this? The book, I'm going to say in a moment, that your book should be an opening salvo of conversations that need to happen. And in one minute, I'm going to say, put a little more flesh on that point, because many of you have said we need conversations. Number one, we really have to work with what we have. 
Um, we, I think, can envision that we're going to have <laughs> a code for the world that is a progressive code for the world. But we do have a lot to work with in white boat trips, international competition network for the US, for, the, for competition, um, national law, regional integration, as some of you, including Antonella, have mentioned, um, working towards the solutions. Number two, and again, this is a um, summary of your conversations, tearing down the silos. We should have and recognize at least notionally a global commons of trade, innovation, policy, competition, and knowledge. And number three, I think, and I'm drawing from Rob and Bill Kovacic here, um, we need to revitalize a working group on trade and competition. And here I'm going to go a step further and say, it's not just a working group on trade and competition now, and it's not just within the WTO now. It has to be a working group on trade, competition, innovation policy, access to knowledge, um, the ecosystem, including interests of developing countries. Given the situation and lay of the land right now, I think it has to be a horizontal collaboration between your team and the WTO, the OECD, the ICN, and UNCTAD to have these mutual conversations, to work ahead and to use your book and this book launch as the opening salvo of the new movement against the parochialism, towards the cosmopolitanism, towards that common vision of vibrant markets that are good for the people. Thank you. Well, thank you so much, uh, Eleanor. Um, I was expecting a, a visionary and, and a stimulating presentation and you've exceeded that expectation. And uh, uh, even better, you have completely eclipsed uh, what my closing remarks would, would have been um, uh, in, a, in, a, in a, a very helpful way. Um, so we'll be spared my sort of tidy uh, you know, bureaucratic um, uh, observations. Uh, and instead, uh, I'll, I'll very simply uh, uh, say that certainly, uh, I think the international community, the, the, the people we work with in Geneva, uh, very much hear you, and uh, certainly uh, there's there's a, a, a tremendous collegial spirit, uh, a, 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 an appetite for that kind of um, uh, cross-cutting, forward-looking work. Uh, and uh, certainly, uh, I know from from working with the the book's uh, authors, uh, many of the chapters are indeed themselves uh, the products of uh, long-standing collaboration. Uh, and, and uh, uh, collegiality. Uh, so, as I've said before, the book is not an end in itself. It is, is, it is meant to be a, a platform or a springboard, perhaps at least a demonstration of, uh, of that, 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 that potential that you've, you've outlined. Of course, it's a totally different matter to extend that to uh, the intergovernmental plane, uh, and that's not our job here sitting in, uh, in, a, in a secretariat. But, uh, but the wherewithal, the content, the, the, the uh, working material uh, is under preparation and uh, we do hope that uh, that uh, member governments uh, policymakers will find will find it useful uh, I'd like to uh, uh, conclude by by thanking all those involved in in this launch uh, I won't go through the whole list again because uh, we're, we're over time but I cannot uh, 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 farewell you you all without passing the floor briefly back to to Rob for for his uh, absolutely final concluding remarks. So Rob, over to you. Thanks so much, Tony. Um, and I will be very brief. Uh, I want to first thank you, Tony, and the entire team at the WTO for organizing this terrific event. And it's been wonderful to be back with some members of the old team. That's great. 
Um, I want to say that um, I'm deeply indebted in my career to persons like uh, Eleanor Fox and Bill Kovacic, and I'm so grateful to them for their collaboration, support, and friendship over the years. I truly am. And the last thing I want to say is that the thing that I'm uh, most proud of in my, in my career uh, is the opportunity to have helped in a modest way to provide opportunities to the next generation and to, I hope, help them and uh, nurture them along a little bit. And in this specific context, I'm, uh, of course, speaking of Anna, Nadia, and Antonella, who've been great collaborators. Um, and of course, there's many others in other facets of the WTO's work as well. Uh, those people are the reason why I don't give up and I have no intention ever of giving up. And um, thanks for your great involvement here today and onward and upward, everyone. Thank, thank you very much, Rob. And a, a final remark, uh, Several of our authors couldn't make it for, for one reason or another, uh, but we are inviting them to, to contribute to what will be a, a package from this, from this session, uh, the recorded commentary. So I, I, we still hope to hear from them. Uh, but thank you. Thank you, everyone. Uh, as I mentioned, this, this, um, this session uh, will be packaged and, and, and put online so that, uh, because for us, frankly, it will be a continuing invaluable resource. Uh, and and uh, some really stimulating ideas about how to take the, the ideas in this book, book forward. Thank you, everyone. And, and uh, I, I wish you, very you all much, Tony. a wonderful rest of the well, evening or a, a very early morning to you, William. Uh, but thank you. thank you, everyone, for, for joining in today. Thank you very much. Thank you Thanks so much. Too. Thank you. Thank you, everyone. Thank Bye. You. Bye. Bye, everyone. Bye. 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 Bye.